Hello and good morning, and welcome to this live BSI webinar titled PPE Regulation Update, Are You Prepared? Today on the panel we have Nathan Shipley and me, Robert Lee. Uh, Nathan is the PPE Group Certification Manager at BSI, and he has worked at BSI for over 20 years, and that makes him have a vast amount of knowledge about the PPE regulation landscape. Nathan also used to be a long distance runner, so let's hope he can last the distance today. Sorry about that joke, Nathan. Um, I'm here to help facilitate today's presentation as BSI UK's media production manager. Okay, thank you very much and good morning or good afternoon wherever you are in the world. Uh, thank you for attending this PPE regulation update webinar um, being carried out by myself, Nathan Shipley, uh, the PPE Group Certification Manager here at BSI. The purpose of today's webinar is that we're going to take you through the following agenda points. The first one is going through the fact that we're the first UK notified body that was accredited to the PPE regulation. We're then going to go through some of the uh, landscapes and timeframes uh, that are covering the transition to the PPE regulation. Uh, we're going to cover things such as scopes under the new PPE regulation and also new obligations that have been uh, put on to importers and distributors as part of the changes. We're also going to look at the actual size of the job uh, with the relating to certificates that have been issued under the PPE directive and that need transitioning over. We're also going to go through a series of clarifications that have come through and come to light since the regulation uh, has been published back in 2016. We're then going to go through with a summary and then we're going to have a option where we can answer some questions that you may have and then we're going to go through some future events that we're going to be running in 2017 and that we can discuss and talk about these changes to you. So if we're going to run another poll, um, so over to you, Rob. Okay, thanks a lot, Nathan. This poll asks a question, which of these apply to your business? Are you a manufacturer, a distributor, an importer, uh, an, another type of organization, for example, a trade body, or perhaps you're a combination of some or all of the above. So it seems that a substantial amount of you are manufacturers. That's 53%. Uh, we don't have any distribu distributors on the line today. Uh, importers, seven. And we do have other types of trade bodies and also combinations of some of the above, too. Okay. Now I'm just going to hand you back over to Nathan. Okay, so BSI um, was the first UK notified body to be listed on the Nando website for the uh, PPE regulation. Um, this is our letter of uh, notification uh, from BIS. Uh, this certifies that, that we are a current notified body under the PPE regulation. And our scope is quite extensive. Uh, we have a range of products uh, that we can certify to Module B, Module C2, and Module D of the new PPE regulation, and it does act very similar to the um, scope that we held under the PPE directive. So it includes things such as buoyancy aids, eye protection and the face protection, uh, head and hearing protection, gloves, hand protection, leg protection, uh, firefighters protection so we have a very extensive scope that we can certify products under the uh, the regulation uh, for all the modules that are applicable back on the uh, 29th of june last week we did issue our first post dated uh, module b certificates we had four organizations that came to our offices in milton keynes which were uh, 3m scott safety uh, johnson safety products and Centurion safety products, and they were the first to be issued their BSI post-dated Module B certificates. Uh, 
the reason that we're trying to get ahead of the game under this is because um, the time frame that we'll be going through later on of 12 months to transition from the directive to the regulation has been seen as quite a short period of time. Uh, so we have the ability to issue out post-dated Module B certificates for manufacturers' products uh, to allow them to be ready before the actual reg regulation comes into play uh, in April 2018. That was a very good day, um, and the certificates were issued by our CEO, Howard Kerr, um, so we're very proud and we're very pleased the fact that we were the first notified body, uh, certainly in the UK, to be able to offer that service. Okay, so if you've been to any of the webinars that we've been running before, um, this, this slide looks a bit familiar. Um, just to give you an overview of the way that we're standing at the moment, the PPE directive was, in fact, one of the first new approach directives when it was issued over 20 years ago. Um, since that time, there's been a lot of changes have taken place. Uh, technologies have changed. Risks have changed. Um, first responders have been uh, involved in uh, CBRN or chemical and biological threats, which perhaps uh, were less of a less of a risk for those types of individuals when the directive was first published. So the need was for the uh, PPE directive to be rewritten and published again. This development process has been taking place over the number of years, and then in 2016, the PPE regulation was published as a, as a document in February 2016. That then gave a period of transition for notified bodies and uh, member states to get and adopt that regulation within their national frameworks, and BSI went through that process and received its certification and listing on NANDO back in April 2017. We then start this transition period of 12 months throughout 2018, and then from 2019 onwards, the PPE regulation only will apply. Okay, so this slide here gives you a series of um, Gantt chart, if you like, of the way that these periods are working. So the regulation was first published on the 12th of February, and then listed in the OJ 20 days later, and then that started off the transition period to allow member states and notified bodies to become accredited and listed on the NANDO website uh, under the PPE regulation. Under that time frame, uh, the notified bodies and the member states will all work to the PPE directive. And then we come to April 2018 uh, when the regulation applies. This will then kick off the 12-month changeover period, um, in which case manufacturers need to get their products certified uh, from the old PPE directive under the new regulation. Once we get to the end in 10, uh, 2019, all certifications, new certifications need to be to the PPE regulation. Though any uh, Article 10 certificates for products that are in the supply chain can be held valid unless they have an invalidity date beforehand up until the 21st of April 2023. So those are some of these, these are some of the key dates that we're talking about. Uh, from the 21st of April 2018, the PPE directive is effectively repealed. From that date, the 21st of April 2018, the PPE regulation shall apply. There is a statement that member states shall not impede making available on the market any products covered by the old PPE directive before the 21st of April 2019, and this gives that one year transition period for manufacturers to get their Article 10s, Article 11As and Article 11Bs moved over from mod uh, to Module B, C2 and Module D. And then again, as written in there with the regulation, that any uh, PPE directive certificates that do not have a expiration date beforehand will become valid or remain valid until 21st of April 2023. Okay, so as with the old PPE directive, the regulation does have a specific scope. Um, the scope for the PPE regulation is that it covers all types of PPE. And there are three types of different categorizations or definitions as to what PPE means. Uh, 
So very similar to the PP directive, the first requirement or the first definition is that PPE is equipment that's designed and manufactured to be worn or held by a person for protection against one or more risk to that person's health or safety, which is taken very much by wording um, under the old PPE directive. It also has a further definition of interchangeable components for equipment referred to in point A that are essential for its protective function. So this could be something such as a particulate or gas or combined filter. The actual filter itself doesn't offer an individual protection, but when fitted to a half mask or a full face mask, means that that product can act as a, as a proper piece of PPE. The third definition is that any connection system for equipment referred to in point A that are not held or worn by a person that are designed to connect to that equipment to an external device or to a reliable anchorage point that are not designed to be permanently fitted, uh, fixed and that do not require fastening works before use are covered and deemed as PPE. So this will cover things such as tripods uh, used in fall arrest uh, for entry into uh, confined spaces, that type of thing, and it brings those into the scope of the PPE regulation. One thing that also needs to be noted is that any products such as medical devices um, that are also deemed as PPE, so things such as uh, examination gloves possibly, uh, should be covered by both regulations and must comply fully with the PPE requirements. This is something that's been brought in uh, after the medical devices directive, uh, which is also going through a period of transition, was amended back in 2010. As with the old PPE directive, there are a number of regulations uh, that, um, sorry, exemptions covered by the PPE regulation. Uh, the regulation does not apply to PPE that is specifically designed for use by the armed forces or in the maintenance of law and order. PPE that's designed to be used for self-defense with the exception of PPE intended for sporting activities. So this could cover things such as rape alarms or possibly mace sprays, those types of things. Uh, PPE that's designed for private use to protect against atmosphere, uh, atmospheric conditions that are not of an extreme nature, uh, damp and water during dishwashing. So those types of products such as uh, foul weather clothing and uh, dishwashing gloves aren't covered by the uh, regulation and also PPE used on seagoing vessels or aircraft are not covered, they're covered by their own uh, regulatory requirements such as the Marine Equipment Directive uh, if the products can be used onto a, onto a ship. And again under the PPE regulation helmets and their visors for drivers and passengers of motorcycles and mopeds are not covered under the regulation, they'll be covered by their own um, unique uh, road traffic laws. Right, we're now going to move on to another poll. Thanks a lot, Nathan. Um, this poll now asks the question, how many products do you have which the PPE regulation applies to? So we're just going to launch that now. Can you let us know how many products do you have which the PPE regulation applies to? Uh, is it 1 to 5, 6 to 10, 11 to 20, 21 plus, or you don't know? Okay, so 26% of you have 1 to 5, 14% uh, have 6 to 10, 9% 11 to 20 products, and a substantial amount with 21 plus products. There, there is almost 30% of you who don't know, so I, I'm not sure whether that's concerning or not, but um, we're now going to hide the poll and uh, pass you back over to Nathan. Okay, thanks a lot, Rob. <clears throat> okay, so just to go through some of the certificate structures uh, and the way that the regulation and the directive are changing, um, once again, the PPE regulation is breaking products down into three different product categories. Um, they are, we'll go into these into a little bit more detail later on, um, but they are very similar to the old PPE directive in that you have a simple category PPE. Um, the activity of placing products that fall within the simple category PPE is effectively a manufacturer's self-declaration under the old PPE directive. Um, 
it's a manufacturer self-declaration again under the new regulation, uh, so it does not require any specific notified body involvement, and that will be covered under what's known as Module A or Annex 4 of the PPE regulation. For intermediate and complex PPE products, uh, the initial process of placing products un onto the market under the old directive was covered under Article 10 of the PPE uh, directive. This is now going to be known as Module B or Annex 5 under the EU and issue you with an EU type examination certificate under the PPE regulations. One of the things that you need to be aware of um, when compiling things such as technical files and managing your transition over is that the requirements of the quality system maintained by a manufacturer are covered under what's known as Module C or Annex 6 of the uh, PPE regulation. So the manufacturers placing product onto the market will need to get any new products certified to the regulation uh, after the uh, 21st of April 2018 and also start the transition process uh, through from there and make sure that process is completed before the 21st of April 2019. As I say, because we're already listed on Nando and uh, accredited under the PPE regulation, one thing that we are offering is the ability to issue post-dated EU type examination certificates to the regulation uh, for those products that need to, to be transitioned over. Um, the idea is that manufacturers can get ahead of the game and be in a position to have certification ready for when the regulation kicks in uh, in April 2018. Now for the complex manufacturers um, making complex PPE, there were two ongoing modules under the PPE directive um, and there's two ongoing modules under the regulation. Those that went through the Article 11a process of annual product testing this is now going to be known as Module C2 or Annex 7 of the PPE regulation. Uh, the process follows is very similar to the Article 11A where samples are independently selected by notified bodies and then tested and to ensure product conformity uh, under the, the new regulation. For Category 3 products where factory uh, assessments were undertaken. This was known as Article 11B under the PPE directive. This is now going to change under Module D of the PPE regulation or Annex 8. Again, the process is very similar uh, for the Module D as it is under the Module 11B. Um, what they're looking to do is have the assessor look at the quality system that's being maintained by the manufacturers and ensure that the product conformity um, compared with that covered under the Module B certificates is also covered. One of the things that we're looking to do is transition our manufacturers through from Article 11A or Article 11B uh, through to C2 or Module D throughout 2018-2019. One thing that they are looking to do is to we're looking to have a certificate to cover certification under those articles or modules um, to cover both throughout that period so that there is no pure transition and you're covered both under the directive and under the new regulation whilst that transition goes through. What we can also do is that if we have some history <clears throat> with the manufacturing uh, organization, we can issue a Module D certificate via desktop review um, rather than having to carry out an initial assessment under the Module D. Um, this will allow us to not have to physically go on site, um, but we'll catch up on those assessments uh, during the normal audit program that BS undertakes when it goes on to site. Okay, so also under the obligations, um, under the PPE regulation, there are now obligations on importers. This is covered by what's known as Article 10 of the PPE regulation. And one of the obligations that is being outlined and specified is that importers have a responsibility to only place compliant PPE onto the marketplace. 
Before this happens, um, the importer shall ensure that the appropriate conformity assessment procedures have been carried out by the manufacturer that they're buying product from. So this will mean that importers have to ensure that uh, documentation such as Module B certificates, um, declarations of conformity, and those types of documents are available and valid um, from the manufacturer prior to actually placing compliant PPE onto the marketplace. If an importer considers or has reason to believe that the PPE is not in conformity, they shall not place it onto the market. Furthermore, the importer shall inform the manufacturer and the market or surveillance authorities to that effect. So not only does the importer have a responsibility for ensuring that PPE is placed, uh, compliant PPE is placed onto the market, they also have an obligation to inform market surveillance authorities, uh, which is something that was never called up under the PPE directive. Also, uh, there is a requirement that importers shall indicate their name, um, their registered trade name or registered trademark and postal address to which they can be contacted through uh, on the PPE. This can be something such as their name, um, zip code or postcode and country, uh, which would get a letter to, to them and will be deemed as an acceptable address. Also, importers should ensure that any PPE within their responsibility, uh, the storage and transportation conditions that they're using do not jeopardize this conformity. So not only do they have a responsibility for ensuring the conformity uh, of the PPE is valid, but they also need to ensure that they have an infrastructure in the logistics chain that ensures that the PPE conform uh, condition isn't jeopardized uh, prior to being received by an end user. Importers also need to keep for a period of 10 years after the PPE has been placed onto the market, a copy of the EU Declaration of Conformity at the disposal of the market surveillance authorities and ensure that the technical documentation can be made available to those authorities upon request. So whereas before importers didn't need to keep those kind of documents available, now they have a, an obligation for keeping those for 10 years from that product has been placed onto the market. Also, importers shall further to a reasoned request from a competent authority, provide it with all the information and documentation in paper or electronic form necessary to demonstrate the conformity of the PPE in a language that can be easily understood by that authority. So really you need things such as declarations of conformity and module B certificates and possibly module C2 and D certificates uh, to prove that the product complies. As well as importers, um, within each region, distributors have uh, obligations that have been placed under them. This has been defined under what's known as Article 11 of the PPE regulation. When the PPE is available on the market, distributors shall act with due care in relation to the requirements of the regulation, so they need to be aware of it and adhere to it. Before making the PPE available onto the market, distributors shall verify that it bears the CE marking and is accompanied by the required instructions in a language that can be understood by end users in the country that the PPE is made to be available. So if the product's gonna be sold into the UK, the languages need to be in English, into Germany, German, so, so forth. Also, distributors need to ensure that they have a, um, logistics and, and uh, infrastructure that does not jeopardize the conformity. So the same as the importers, they need to ensure that while the PPE is under their responsibility, any storage or transport conditions do not jeopardize its conformity. And again, distributors who consider or have reason to believe that the PPE that's being made available on the market doesn't conform with the regulation, they need to have, re withdraw it or recall it immediately. Furthermore, uh, where PPE presents a risk, distributors shall immediately inform the competent national authorities, giving details in particular of the non-conformity and any corrective action measures that have been taken. So again, even further down the supply chain, uh, distributors have a part to play under the regulation and uh, need to be able to uh, identify competent and conforming PPE uh, when it's being placed on there and being used by end users.
Okay, so if you are a document, um, an importer or a distributor, or even if you're a manufacturer, these are some of the things that um, importers or distributors are possibly going to be asking you for in the future. So what do these, these guys need? They're going to need a copy of the manufacturer's Module B EU type examination certificate. They need a copy of the EU declaration of conformity for the product um, that they're handling in the official language of the country that the PPE is going to be made available. The importer and distributor needs to ensure that the user instructions are in the official language for the country which the PPE is being made available. And also the importers and distributors need to hold these records for at least 10 years. Okay, so looking at the size of the job, transferring um, certified products over from the PPE directive into the regulation, the ESF uh, had a survey with uh, notified bodies just trying to put some quantification on the, uh, on the size of the job that was um, in hand. And it's estimating that there are 275,000 PPE certificates issued by notified bodies um, in Europe of which those is anticipating that a third of those have been issued since 2014. So that's a large number of Article 10 certificates for products that have been out there in the marketplace. Even from a BSI perspective, um, we've issued out 1,945 Article 10 certificates. We have 29 Article 11A certificates issued and we have 73 Article 11B sites that have been certified. So for one notified body, we have over 2,000 documents and sites that, are, um, that have been issued over the last 20 years. Now, admittedly, a lot of those aren't going to get transitioned uh, through, and I know a lot of manufacturers that we've been talking to are going through a process of streamlining some of the ranges and uh, not certifying some of those products that have been uh, too old and withdrawn specifications. But even so, it's a large process that needs to be undertaken. Also, another factor going in is that um, products certified to the new regulation need to be to the latest and current standards. There's currently 214 harmonized specifications listed in the uh, PPE official journal. Um, of those, 89 have been uh, issued after 2014, which means that uh, over half are over five years old. So we may be going through some process of review, reissue, and those types of things, which manufacturers need to be aware of um, when transitioning products through. I certainly know uh, from personal experiences that um, gloves are going through a large number of changes within their product standards. So these need to be anticipated and tested for uh, when manufacturers are changing their products from the PPE directive through to the PPE regulation. And it's something that people need to be mindful of uh, when trying to manage that transition and ensure that they have uh, you know, time allocated prior to, uh, to, to making that transfer over. As I said before, uh, one of the solutions is that um, initially the transfer over from the directive to the regulation was pretty well much being penned in from uh, 21st of April 2018 to the 21st of April 2019. To try and increase this notified bodies that have been accredited and listed on the Nando site can issue what's known as post-dated Module B EU type examination certificates. So the idea is that we can issue out a Module B EU type examination certificate that becomes valid uh, from the 21st of April 2018. The idea is that this will allow a transition period of almost up to a year to be added on to uh, and out onto the changes. It will allow manufacturers to uh, get ahead of the game. Any products certified must be to the latest standards. Um, so if you've got some safety eyewear that's to uh, EM166 1995 or to some of the older glove standards, then they need to be updated to the latest specifications. And the five-year validity will start from the 21st of April 2018. So the BSI Module B certificates that you saw the, uh, the photograph of and a couple of earlier ones, um, they will be 
valid from the 21st of April 2018 and have a validity until the 21st of April 2023. Okay, so some of the things that we are uh, going through is some of the clarifications that have been received from the Commission and also from uh, Notified Body Activities and to add a little bit of meat to the information that's given within the text of the, uh, the, the actual regulation itself. Okay, so there's been some discussions as to um, when the PPE purely um, can be applied and really the cutoff date that we're looking to work to is the 21st of April 2019. So this will be the end of the transition from uh, uh, 2018 to 2019. So unless a product is actually in the supply chain uh, post 21st of April 2019, it must be uh, made available certified under the PPE regulation. Um, so what the definition of within the supply chain is really down to what the manufacturers can, can do. I know some large uh, global organizations that we deal with um, have sort of purchasing agreements internally, um, but unless the product is within, within the sort of supply chain post 2019 April, uh, then it must be certified under the PPE regulation. One of the new uh, requirements under the regulation is the categorization of what's known as design calculations. Uh, these are being inserted in there, but what we are taking the stance on is that design calculations do not need to be included within the technical file if uh, the product has been tested and meets the requirements of a harmonized specification. They can still be used with some uh, technical specification and approved products, and they can be useful with products such as high visibility clothing, where a thing such as a surface area can be tested on the smallest uh, available product, and then calculations can be used to prove that larger, uh, larger supply goods or garments will still comply with the, uh, the relevant standard. So they do have their place, uh, but I think for the run of the mill, or the, you know, most of the time, if the product's been tested to a harmonized specification, then the manufacturer can admit to using uh, design calculations as part of their technical file. One of the questions that we are being asked is with regards to the age of uh, test reports as part of this transfer. And we are getting a lot of mis mixed messages across from uh, from Europe at the moment. France, for example, is stating a 10-year uh, maximum validity on test reports. The UK test and cert um, had no limits um, available on there. One thing that does need to be sort of taken into account is that the manufacturer needs to be able to demonstrate compliance to the current standard and also the state of the art. So what I would say is that although BSI is uh, coming in line with the UK interpretation, but we're not putting a specific time, lane, time, time limit onto uh, test reports as part of this transfer, what you do need to be, be able to do is be able to demonstrate that the product meets the requirements of the current standards and also that you know, the, the product test reports that you have reflect the product that's been made in the state as it is today. So those factors need to be taken into account and really dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. One of the things is that for Category 3 uh, PPE products, Article 10 certificates need to have a, a valid Article 11A or Article 11B certification. Module Bs need to have a Module C2 or a Module D certification. The way that BSI is looking to manage that change is that we're going to have desktop reviews to run and change the Article 11As to 11Bs to Module C2 or Module Ds, and also look to have a joint certification to cover um, both certifications to the PP directive and to the regulation. So there'll be a continuous um, loop of certificates allowing manufacturers to place products onto the market unhindered. As I say, if you currently have a module, uh, sorry, an Article 11A or 11B with us, we can cover that and decide whether you want to transfer 
at your next assessment or product test, or if you want to go down the desktop route and have something in, in place uh, from, from day one. Okay, so some of the other questions or some of the other clarifications we've received. Um, if a Module B certificate is reissued within its five-year life, does that start the five years again? The response that we've had from Europe from this one is no, uh, unless there is a fundamental change to the way that the product is made or its design or its performance or, um, or a standard change, the five-year validity will not be affected by any certificate reissues uh, throughout that period of time. Another one that is coming into place is that um, domestic oven gloves are now covered under the PPE reg regulation scope. There was some question with regards to the classification of product uh, that this will fall under. Uh, this has been finally defined as what's known as category two or intermediate PPE. There is no current harmonized specification for oven gloves. So there is a BS specification that is available. Um, so manufacturers could certify the product to a specification using things from current glove standards, such as EN420 or EN407 for um, thermal protection. Um, but we can sort of discuss that with um, you know, on a one-to-one -one basis and, and cover those to get those certified under the uh, under the PPE regulations. Okay, uh, that leads us on to our third um, poll, so I'll hand you back over to Rob. Thanks a lot, Nathan. Um, the next poll that we have is, how prepared are you for the PPE regulation based on everything that Nathan's been saying so far? So I'm just going to launch that now. Um, please do select one. Zero to 25 percent is how prepared you feel you are, 26 to 50%, 51 to 75, 76 to 100%, or I, I don't know. So the results are in, and the preparedness uh, for some people is 22% for 0 to 25%, 17% for those who think you're coming up between a quarter and a halfway there, 17% uh, of you think you're between halfway there and three quarters of the way there, and 11% say that you're sort of three quarters of the way to, to pretty much nearly ready for it. Um, there's a staggering amount of you who say that you just don't know at the minute, so uh, um, we'll just hide that poll and pass you back over to Nathan. Okay, thanks a lot for that, Rob. Okay, so just to run through um, some of the summaries that um, are going through with regards to the uh, PPE regulation. Uh, the PPE regulation EU 2016-425 was now being published, was published early on in 2016. We're in the process of going through that changeover almost halfway through, so we have uh, less, than, less than 12 months before the, uh, the, the regulation itself starts coming in. After April 2019, only PPE regulation approved PPE can be issued into the uh, European market. The regulation itself does have some specific scope and exclusions, and we've gone through those. There are some changes to some of the module names. Uh, so you have the old Article 10, Article 11A, Article 11B. These are now being replaced by Module B, C2, Module D. There are some changes to the product categorization. Um, some products such as life jackets and hearing protection which was covered under module, uh, sorry, intermediate category two is moving into category three. So in those instances, those manufacturers need to have uh, some form of ongoing surveillance in place before 21st of April 2019. There's a requirement that a declaration of conformity or at least a web link is available on the user instructions with each product that is being supplied by a manufacturer. 
There are now very specific requirements for distributors and importers, and they have obligations whereby if they feel that uh, non-conforming PPE uh, is reported to the national authorities, if they come into contact with that. Bespoke PPE um, is covered by the uh, PPE regulations specifically, so this covers things such as prescription spectacles, custom-made hearing protection, or one-offs. There is a validity of five years uh, for the EU type examination certificates that are issued under the regulation, and that five-year validity doesn't change even if the certificate is up issued within that five-year time frame. And I say just below is the Gantt chart um, showing what the various activities are and the time frames that are uh, that are required to and be adhered to uh, throughout the course of the regulation changes. Okay, so um, do we have any questions at all coming through from the uh, from from the attendees? So uh, one of the first questions that we have, Nathan, is. Um, Shall we show postal address of manufacturers on the marking? There is a requirement under the regulation that the um, manufacturer, the importer, need to place their sort of name, trademark, um, postal address onto the product itself. We have been getting some clarifications on that as to what an address is, and the um, approach is very similar to the directive in that the address can be deemed as something that could get a letter to that organization. Um, so if you're based in the UK, um, your company name, your postcode or zip code, and um, UK would get a letter there. So if that works wherever you're based throughout the world, uh, then that could be deemed as your postal address. One of the other aspects that are being raised is um, there is a, a kind of interpretation whereby if it's not feasible to print uh, names, addresses, and postal addresses and that type of thing uh, on the product itself, then this can be then put on to either the user instructions or the product packaging as a means to meet those requirements. So if for some reason it's not feasible, either economical, practical, or technologically uh, viable to print names onto the actual physical product itself, then you can place or you can put that information either onto the packaging or the user instructions and meet those requirements. So hopefully that will um, kind of lessen some of the burden on some of the manufacturers and give an interpretation uh, where the PPE is too small or the production process is uh, doesn't lend itself to individual uh, product marking. Um, that can appear on the, the next packaging or the user instructions that go up on it. Okay, thanks a lot, Nathan. Uh, we do have another question which has come in, which is the change of regulation. Uh, what does this actually mean for the ENBS standards uh, supporting the regulation? Okay, um, the PPE regulation will have an official journal um, of harmonized specifications, and the current interpretation is that anything that is harmonized under the PPE directive will be deemed as harmonized under the PPE regulation. So even when you go to some of the old PPE directive specifications and they have an Annex ZA um, which refer to clauses under the PPE directive, um, they will be deemed as acceptable and as harmonized under the regulation. Uh, so if it's referenced under the PPE directive official journal, then those specifications will be acceptable under the PPE regulation. Thanks a lot, Nathan. Uh, we've got a question which I believe you may have covered, but I just wanted to just run it by you again, and that is um, whether domestic oven gloves are going to be classified as Category 2 or 3 PPE. 
Yeah, we did get some clarification on this one. There was a bit of debate as to whether oven gloves, because of you know you can you can cook things at 200 degrees, whether it would be um, classed as a complex PPE. Um, but the final final definition was that oven gloves would fall under category two, um, so need a, a module B certification only, um, and they would not be classed as category three complex PPE. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, another one that's come in here is about uh, someone who's an importer, and they have a question for private labels. Uh, can I use the manufacturer's certification, or under the new regulations, um, we have to, cer to certify by ourselves? No. Um, the process of own brand labeling is still going to be um, carried out under the PPE regulation, uh, and we have the ability to issue own brand label certificates um, or private branding. Um, so if you've, you're an importer and you've been doing own brand labeling for products under the PPE directive, um, we can issue out own brand label certificates under the, under the regulation. So that process will not change. The difference is for the BSI certificates is that they will now have a validity of five years on them, um, but you will still be able to issue and accept uh, own brand label certificates. Okay, so we have a question from a medical device manufacturer, amongst other things, for medical monitors uh, used during surgery. One of the accessories of those particular monitors or eye shields, uh, which enable the user to view two and 3D images um, and also to protect the user from bodily fluids. Do they have to fulfill all the requirements of the PPE regulation in the future in addition to the medical device directives? We've come across uh, similar type products before whereby um, eye protection has been used in a and &E or ER type um, environments and people wear sort of safety eye shields or um, eye shields attached to surgical masks to protect against blood splatter. If the product is offering protection against uh, bodily fluids, then yes, they would need to be certified um, under the PPE regulations. There are um, industrial eye protection standards such as EM166 which has liquid splash type clauses in there. Um, so yes, the answer is the product would have to be certified under the PPE regulation if it is offering protection for the wearer. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, another one is, if a prototype PPE garment is made, does it need to be completed in accordance with the regulation? It's, I think the, the point is whether the product is going to be available. I mean, if you're making a prototype and it's for sort of research purposes, um, it's not necessarily going to go out into the field, um, then no. But if you're making that product available onto the market, whether there's a financial transaction or whether they're being given away, um, then yes, you need to get the product certified. Um, but if it's a prototype purely for internal use that you're using as a development, then no, you wouldn't. Okay, we have a question about um, what is bespoke PPE? Bespoke PPE is something where the PPE is being made for a specific individual um, or can be adjusted by uh, an individual or user. Um, there's kind of two types of um, PPE that are bespoke. One is where it's made off as a, as a one-off. Um, things such as that would be things like prescription safety eyewear, um, where you go into an optometrist and you get a pair of glasses made that are safety, um, but they're made to you as a specific prescription power. Or the other type of thing, it would be something like custom molded hearing protection, uh, where you go into a, an audiologist and you get a molding impression made from your ears and um, they, you know, they, they create a specific earplug for you. For you. Um, the other types would be um, for something such as a, um, you have a firefighter 
that's the size of Goliath and you have to make him a specific tunic and, and, and pair of trousers where you're making them as a, as a one-off. So it really is any type of PPE which is being made for a specific individual user or end user. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, another one is, is, is e-user info acceptable instead of inserting a hard copy user information together with the uh, PPE? I'm assuming from this you're talking electronic um, type information. Unfortunately, no. Um, the regulation does require hard copies of user instructions to be supplied with the um, with the PPE. You can use a web link for the declarations of conformity um, to be supplied electronically, but a hard copy of user instructions still needs to be applied or supplied with the product under the regulation. Okay, the next one is, um, I'd like to know for examination gloves uh, PPE, would the approval be via desktop assessment or would it be subject to a site audit? And almost the second question in there, is the site audit going to be uh, um, after the issue of the certificate or before? For a set of exam gloves um, that are offering protection against microorganisms, they will be complex PPE, um, so they need to be tested. Um, and one of my colleagues, King Demetrio, has done a, a blog uh, listing the, the various standards that are available on the BSI website, which is very useful to, to download. Um, so there would need to be product testing involved, um, or if you have that product, then a review of that data, and then a technical file review. Because there will be complex PPE, then yes, some form of ongoing surveillance would need to be undertaken. Um, if the manufacturer has their own QA system in place and they want to go down the Article 11B or the Module D route, um, then those processes would need to be run in parallel with the product certification aspect. Um, if the manufacturer wants to go down the Module C2 route, which is the annual product testing, um, we can start that process uh, nine months from when the Module B certificate has been issued. So kind of in answer, um, from a bullet point perspective, we'd have to do product testing for examination gloves to the, the, the relevant standards and then issue out the Module B certificate. Um, if the manufacturer is going down the factory assessment route under Module D, then the assessment would need to take place during that Module B process. If the manufacturer goes down the Module C2, C2 route, um, we can issue out the Module B and then follow up with the Module C2 testing between nine and 12 months after that Module B certificate's been issued. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, we're going to take a few more questions, but we're going to have to wrap it up just to, um, just after 11. So one of those questions is, can we start testing our products prior to Module D certification? Yes. I mean, you can start product. If you have a, a um, portfolio of products and some are um, to withdrawn specifications, then yes you can start testing straight away to try and get those up to the latest specifications. So my advice to any manufacturer is if you have old withdrawn product standards, then get them updated ASAP. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, we have a question about standard. Does the new EN374 regulation need to be covered by April 2018? Yes, uh, they do. As I say in my previous response, um, we have a very good glove guide um, on the BSI website, which you can download and gives you the full list of product standards. Um, but yes, the uh, EN374 Part 3 has uh, been superseded, and there is now the EN374 Part 4 that need to be um, complied with uh, prior to the regulation. So. You, it, I feel for glove manufacturers, in there's, there's a lot of changes going on, uh, but those changes need to be done before the regulation kicks in. Okay, we're going to go with two more final questions. Uh, one is following up on the importer postal address on the packaging leaflet. When does that come into effect, um, as in the product being placed onto the EU market um, 28th of April or 
sorry, beg your pardon, as in the product being placed on the EU market in April 2018 or April 2019? Effectively, that needs to happen once the product has been certified to the regulation and is claiming compliance to the regulation. So it will be at that point between 21st of April 2018 and 2019 when the product is going out there as compliant to the PPE regulation, then the importers and the manufacturers' uh, name and address need to appear on there. So as soon as you're claiming compliance to the regulation, uh, addresses need to appear on the product or at least on the next um, you know, sort of user instructions or packaging if that's not viable. We have a question here about the clause um, stated about the transfer of the PPE obligation of manufacturers to importers slash distributors if the importer or distributor change the product to their brand trademark. Does this mean that the importer or distributor need to retest and reapply the product with notified body um, despite that product having been certified through the manufacturer's application? If you're talking about the same sort of scenario as you are with own brand labeling um, and you know the, the, the manufacturer at source is happy for own brand labeling to take place, then no, um, as long as they're allowed to allow their intellectual property or the, you know, their test reports and that type of thing um, to be used. So as long as they're, they're happy for sharing intellectual property, then no, there shouldn't be any need for retesting. Okay, I guess that is it. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up there, uh, Nathan. Um, obviously, we've got lots and lots of questions from everyone who's joined us today. We haven't been able to get through all of them, I'm afraid, but we are going to um, try to answer those questions later on when we collate all of the results from, from the webinar. Um, what I'd like to say is that just before the end of the webinar, sorry, I beg your pardon, just once the webinar closes, there is going to be a short survey which will ask you a few questions about um, the webinar itself, the content, the pace, and 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 how you felt the quality of, of it was. Um, in there is a comments box as well. So if you have any further questions that you'd like to ask us, please do feel free to do so in that comments area. Um, Finally, I'd also like to draw your attention to the handout that we've been we've made available. It should be in your panel area, so I'll just give you a second to try and go in there to, to download it. And um, I gather Nathan wants to say something else. Yeah, we've got uh, just before we wrap up. I'd um, just like to say thank you very much. We've this is I think the fourth seminar that we've run so far, and I think this has been the most interactive one with the questions and all that. So that's been really good. So uh, just like to sort of personally thank you all for that. Um, we do have some future events uh, timetabled as well. Um, on the 7th of September this year, we're looking at running a um, paid for webinar on technical files to the PP regulation. Um, it's going to be very um, in detail, technical, um, and based very heavily on the seminar, successful seminar that we ran uh, back in May in our UK offices, and it's learning on how to get your technical files up to speed prior to the, uh, the, the documentation changes. Um, we're also going to be showing at the A plus A show in Dusseldorf uh, between the 17th and 20th of October 2017. We're going to be in Hall 11, um, Stand C42. Um, so that's where we're going to be there. So we can talk to one of our experts. The full team are going to be out there in that one. Um, and if you have any other information that you want to sort of get from us, here's our contact details um, that you can uh, you can you can email, phone, or visit the BSI website. Thanks a lot, Nathan. Um, just to also let you know that we're going to try and make these slides I, I gather are available to you. Um, later on too and we're also going to see if we can try and get a, a, a video recording of this as well to, to share with you later. Um, so without further ado I'd just like to wrap the webinar up now and say thank you very much for joining us and uh, we hope to see you soon. Thank you.